after studying this module, you shall be able to know the component of balance of payment of a country, analyze the movement of India's balance of payment since 1970, know the main cause behind India's balance of payment crisis, know how the government and central bank can together prevent the balance of payment crisis. This module deals with the basic theory of balance of payment which talks about the definition and component of balance of payment of a country, movement of India's balance of payment before and after economic liberalization in 1991. This has been discussed in this module along with the reasons of the balance of payment crisis which took place in India at the end of 1980s. As the basic theory suggests, the BOP of a country at the end of the year should be balanced but it is hardly the case. Each time either the balance of payment is in deficit or it is in surplus. This module discusses the various measures which can be taken by the government and the central bank to prevent the BOP crisis situation. The balance of payment is an account where a country records all its economic transactions with the rest of the world. In other words, the balance of payment tracks the incoming and outgoing money flow of a country. The BOP has two components, the current account and the capital account. The transactions which are recorded in the current account does not have future claims, where transactions which are recorded in the capital account shows the net change in the ownership of the foreign assets. Broadly, the current and capital account include the transactions of the following items. Under current account, we have balance of trade, which is equivalent to earnings from export minus payment from imports, trade in goods, net invisibles. Under capital account, we have FDI, which is foreign direct investment, that is investment made by a company into another company who is based in another country. It is a net inflow of investment. So what we have is in the current account net investment income and then we have under that interest and dividend received on investment done across borders, remittances from residents in overseas. Under the capital account, we have foreign institutional investment, which includes the transactions related to purchase and sale of foreign stocks, bonds, etc. It is considered to be a liquid or asset and it is also known as hot money. We also have banking capital and loans, which are NRI deposits, borrowing of banks from parent bodies. Then we have external commercial borrowings and foreign aids. So BOP in the accounting terminology has two sides. If the country receives money, then it is known as credit transaction. And if the country has paid the money, then the transaction is recorded as a debit. According to accounting theory, credits and debits should be balanced. And the balance of payment should be zero at the end of the year. In reality, this rarely, rarely happens. There are always statistical discrepancies, errors and omissions. So balance of payment can be expressed as current account plus capital account plus net errors and omissions, which then should be equal to zero. According to IMF, the definition of BOP includes three accounts, current, capital and financial account. Financial account records all the transactions related to the economy's external financial assets and liabilities. So we have current account plus capital account plus financial account plus balancing item which should be equal to zero. India's BOP and balance of payment crisis. 70s and 80s were the time when trading system was governed by the complex system of licensing. India's trade barriers were more of non-tariff barriers than tariffs. Import license were given on two bases, essentiality principle and non-availability principle. Firstly, if the government felt that the product is essential to be imported and secondly, there should be no domestic production for that product, then only then were the import license granted. In mid-1980s, exports began to grow slowly because of the adaptation of modern technologies in the industrial sector. But still the growth of export was slower than the growth in imports. That is why the BOP did not improve, though the exports were growing. The balance of payment was negative around $14 million during the period 70 to 90. It was highest in the year 77, where it reached 
2,141 million dollars. By the end of 1980s, the financial reserves of the Indian government started deteriorating. This resulted from a significant increase in the current account deficit and there was no possibility of borrowing from the foreign investors as they had already lost their confidence in the Indian market. There was a mismatch between the domestic saving and investment at that time due to which there was a high current account deficit. And all this state of affairs which was happening in 1980s put pressure on the government to take initiative for economic reforms. The process of trade liberalization started in 1980s though it was very slow. Government started giving many export incentives and to increase the pace of trade reforms the method of quantitative import control was changed to protection based system or a protection based tariff. But still the situation didn't change much and there was a time in the late 1980s when the government did not have enough reserves to meet just one month of import bills. So during 89-90, the balance of payment sharply fell from a positive value of $136 million to negative value of $2,492 million. Year 1991 was considered to be the most difficult year in the Indian history of balance of payment. This was the year when India was facing high inflation, high fiscal and current account deficit and high domestic and foreign debts. This has been indicated in figure where we have the balance of payment from 1970 to 1990. Finally, the major step for economic reforms and trade liberalization took place in 1991. The tariff protection were relaxed and import licensing was abolished. Other reforms which were directly and indirectly associated with India's foreign trade were to reduce the control on location choice and controls on administrative prices were reduced in some sectors. The main focus was on export oriented growth. Gradually, India's financial sector also began to liberalize. Many researchers have pointed out in their studies that in the post-reform period, the trade volume rose significantly and the major contributor to this was manufacturing sector. In figure, we have the balance of payments from 1991 to 2014. Figure shows the movement of balance of payment after liberalization in 1991. In 1990, the balance of payment was negative at $2,492 million and Indian government did not have enough funds to support its import debt. So in 1991, liberal reforms were initiated. Starting of economic reforms in 1991 increased the balance of payment from negative $2,492 million in 1990 to positive $2,599 million dollars in 91. In the period 91 to 2014, BOP was the highest in the year 2007 at 92164 million dollars. In 2007, the current account deficit was high at 17034 million dollars, but the capital account surplus was also very high at 107993 million, which offset the deficit created in the current account. After 2007, all of a sudden the balance of payment declined to negative 20080 million dollars in 2008. The reason for this was the financial crisis which mounted in the year 2008. Due to the financial crisis, the capital account surplus decreased from 107993 million dollars in 2007 to just 9146 million dollars in 2008. The balance of payment had increased after a negative 12831 million dollars in 2011 to 61405 million dollars in 2014. This is due to the persistent fall in the current account deficit since 2011. The main causes of India's BOP crisis in 1990. The main causes behind the balance of payment crisis which arose in the late 1980s were first the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. India had a significant trade with Soviet Union up till 1980s. India used to import capital and defense goods from Soviet Union. In 1991, the world's most powerful union dissolved due to the collapse of the communist government. The flow of rupee trade credit and the export to the Eastern Europe declined in 1991. India had a major setback with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. The second is the Iraq and Kuwait war in 1990. Iraq invaded Kuwait in August of 1990. This was the starting of the Gulf War 
crude oil prices increased rapidly which badly hurt India. This forced India to buy crude oil from the spot market at a much higher price. As a result, the oil bills increased from 40% in 1989 to 60% in 1990. Export to, to these two countries were also badly affected. Third is slow export growth. Growth rate of trading partners of India was slow during 1989 to 91. World export growth had declined from 4.5% in 1989 to 2.25% in 1990. The decline in export was much greater in the case of United States, which was the single largest exporting partner of India at that time. The export growth of India was very slow in late 1980s, due to which India initiated its trade reforms in 1991. The fourth was political instability. The period of 89-91 in India's history is marked with political instability. Within two years, there were three coalition governments, first headed by Sri Rajiv Gandhi, second Sri V.P. Singh, and third by Sri Chandrasekhar. In May 1991, fresh elections were conducted, and Sri P.V. Narsimha Rao came into power with Dr. Manmohan Singh as his finance minister. Fifth, shaking of investor confidence. In late 1980s, the international credit rating agencies reduced the credit rating of India. Investors were losing their confidence in investing their money into the Indian market. With the loss of investors' confidence, commercial bank financing became more difficult and outflows were more as compared to inflows. Sixth, non-oil imports. In comparison to 1970s, the growth of imports were much higher than the growth of exports in 1980s. The rise in trade deficit was mainly due to the rise in the import of non-oil items. Seventh, net decline in the invisibles. The net invisibles as a percentage of GDP in the sixth five-year plan was 2.2%, 1980 to 85, which had declined to 1% in the seventh plan, 1985 to 90. The surplus which was generated by the invisible trade supported 55% of the trade gap in the sixth plan, whereas on the other hand, only 25% of the trade gap was supported by the surplus in invisibles in the seventh plan. Eighth, external debts. In the period 85 to 90, the current account deficit was increasing and it became very difficult to sustain. This deficit was basically financed through more costly external borrowing and NRI deposit. The average interest on the external borrowings rose and the average maturity period reduced. This put India under more pressure to repay the external debt which had increased in 1980s. Ninth, exchange rate. Some of the researchers have pointed out that one of the cause of balance of payment crisis was the, was the overvaluation of exchange rate at that time. Measures to correct the BOP deficit. As we know, the BOP is not balanced. It can be surplus or deficit. If there is a deficit in the BOP, then the policy makers can take the following measures to curb this deficit. First, make changes in the trade policies. There are basically two changes which the policy makers should focus to reduce the deficit in BOP of a country. First, to promote exports. Second, to restrain imports. Exports can be promoted by reducing export duties, decreasing the interest rate on credit financing used for exports, granting subsidies to those manufacturers who are net exporters of the country, thus lowering the excise duty which are imposed on the exporters will make the domestic goods more competitive in the world market. Duty drawback is also available. On the other hand, to substitute the imports, government can take decisions to increase the tariff and non-tariffs on the imported goods and services. Import license can be made compulsory. Items which are not essential should be strictly prohibited for importing. In India's case, before 1991 reforms, India was practicing these policies to reduce the deficit in BOP, but was unable to achieve success. Many a time, India approached IMF to bail out, and lastly, when the BOP deficit was too high to sustain, India took decision to liberalize its trade policies in 1991. Second, policies to reduce expenditure. The major challenge for a government is to reduce the country's aggregate expenditure. Reduction in the aggregate expenditure will reduce the demand of the foreign good or imports and can help in solving the balance of payment deficit problem. Aggregate expenditure can be reduced by adopting contractionary, monetary and fiscal policy. 
Under contractionary monetary policy, central bank tries to restrict the availability of credit. This is done by increasing the lending rates, which will discourage both firms and households to invest and consume. As a result, it will reduce the investment and consumption expenditure. Central bank can use other instruments like the CRR, which is the cash reserve ratio, SLR, which is the statutory liquidity ratio, OMO, which is open market operations, repo rates, reverse repo rates, etc., to reduce the aggregate expenditure in an economy. Tightening the monetary policy is quite effective in controlling the inflation by reducing the aggregate demand. Lowering of inflation or domestic price level will discourage imports. In a country like India, there are certain limitations for adopting the contractionary monetary policy. It will adversely affect the investments of a country which is very much in need for growth, which a country like India is. When there is recession or slowdown in the economy, growth, then contractionary monetary policy will fail to address the problem and will adversely affect the economic growth of a country. Economies which are at the developing stage should use the monetary policy along with other policies like trade policies and fiscal policies to handle the balance of payment deficit problem. Government can adopt contractionary fiscal policies to reduce the deficit in the balance of payment. Direct taxes like income tax, indirect taxes like excise and sales tax should be increased to reduce aggregate expenditure, which eventually reduces the imports of a country. Government can reduce its expenditure, especially the non-development expenditure. Reduction in the government expenditure will have direct as well as indirect effect, as the theory of multipliers suggests, on the aggregate expenditure. It's not a cakewalk to reduce the government expenditure and increase taxes because there are other problems attached to it. For example, due to increase in taxes, people's incentive to work can reduce. Public agitations will be there against government implementing an increase in taxes. Third is devaluation of a currency. If a country relatively is able to increase the prices of imported goods and reduce the price of exported goods, it can solve the problem of balance of payment deficit. So devaluation basically means reducing the foreign exchange rate for the domestic currency with respect to the foreign currency. Devaluation is done under the fixed exchange rate and is done occasionally with the permission of the IMF. After the Bretton Woods system, many countries have adopted flexible exchange rate system where the exchange rate is determined by the market forces. Under the flexible exchange rate system, domestic currency can depreciate or appreciate against the foreign currency. Central bank takes effective measures to check the depreciation in the domestic currency. In 1991, India devalued its currency from rupees 20 per USD to rupees 25 per USD in order to tackle the balance of payment deficit situation. By devaluating its currency against the foreign currency, a country tries to reduce its export price relative to import price. This will increase the export and reduce the imports of a country. Devaluation of a currency is also referred as the expenditure switching policy as the expenditure of a country will shift from imported goods to domestic goods. We should also keep in mind that according to Marshall Lerner condition, if the sum of the elasticity of export and import is greater than 1, then devaluation will improve balance of payment. Otherwise, if it is less than 1, it will adversely affect the balance of payment. Income absorption approach by Sidney S. Alexander suggests that if a country wants its devaluation policy to be a success, then it should have sufficient amount of goods and services to support the fall in the price of export due to devaluation. Balance of payment of a country is an account in which transactions related to all the inflow and outflow of the currency is recorded. Balance of payment according to the theory should always balance at the end of the year, but due to some discrepancies, this is not always true. The movement of India's balance of payment shows that at the end of 1980s, India did not have enough reserve to finance its import bills. So in 1991, Indian government took the initiative to liberalize the economic policies of India to overcome the situation. There were lots of reasons why India faced the balance of payment crisis in the late 80s. Some of the prominent reasons are breaking of Soviet Union in 1990, Iran and Kuwait war in 1990, political instability in India, low investors' confidence, non-oil imports were high, external debts were mounting, share of net invisibles in India's GDP has declined at that time. 
government and the central bank of a country can adopt certain measures to help a country overcome the problem of BOP deficit. These measures can be employed to increase the balance of payment of a country, but there are certain limitations to some of the measures like applying contractionary monetary and fiscal policy. Contractionary monetary policy can reduce the investment in a country which can hamper the economic growth of a country. On the other hand, it is hard to implement the contractionary fiscal policy.